everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator, and I'm so glad to welcome you to our noon GPS, our first in our series of early childhood events. Uh, as you know, this is the 20, or you may not know, this is the 27th year of the Glenbard Parent Series. As always, we are delighted to welcome parents, caregivers, school staff leaders uh, from throughout the area, near and far, especially now that we're in Zoom. Please share the resource, like us on Facebook, and let everybody know these are free with no registration ever. Everyone is always, always welcome. We're so grateful to our many sponsors that help us put this out into the world. The Emmy Gaffey Foundation, the Prevention Leadership Team of the DuPage County Health Department, DuPage Medical Group, our Birth to Five Community Coalition of District 93, CASE, the Special Ed Cooperative, the Sabrin Goodman Center, an affiliate of the Lillian Gary, Larry Goodman Foundation, Kids Matter, Glenbard Early Childhood Collaborative, Kiwanis, and the College of DuPage. This is our brochure for this year. If you go to glenbardgps.org and look on the back, you will also see the additional sponsors, bolded and not bolded, all the ones that share the resource and help put this on financially so we can be here today with our special guest. So we always like to start out with just a little bit preview of what's coming up, but I, I want you to know um, about the fact that we have three early childhood events. This is our first. We'll be here today at noon and at 7 p.m. And then our next one will be with Micheline Duclef. She is an NPR reporter who traveled worldwide, went to some ancient cultures, and then wrote the book Hunter Gather Parent. She will be with us on November 3rd at noon and 7 p.m. Uh, she has a lot to teach us about what we can learn from these ancient cultures. So I think that'll be another interesting talk. And then we'll conclude our early childhood series with Dr. June Lee and Dana Winters. They are with the Fred Rogers Institute and Harvard University, and they'll be speaking at 7 p.m. on March 1st. Coming up on the regular series, uh, next week, we have a special event. The other Westmore is our community read. He also has a young adult version, if you have a young adult uh, person in your home. Um, he's written a remarkable story about his life, um, very accomplished life, and he'll write about the other Westmore, about a young man who grew up also in Baltimore, also the child of a single parent, uh, raised by a single parent, and uh, the circumstances that let one to be in jail and one to uh, eventually work for the White House and become a Rhodes Scholar. This should be a very, very informative, inspiring talk. September brings our uh, Mental Health Awareness, Suicide Awareness Month, and there are a few programs. Lisa Demore will be with us on September 23rd, Under Pressure, Taking Control of Stress and Anxiety. She'll be at noon speaking solo. And then at 7 p.m., she will be in conversation with Lori Gottlieb, the author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, a therapist, her therapist, Our Lives Revealed. And then there's another program coming up with Ross Zabo at the end of the month on depression. Let's talk about it. So again, spread the word. Let everybody know that we are here uh, we'll take some questions at the end. Please um, let us know what questions you might have by email, gilda underscore ross at glenbard.org or in the chat and Q&A. I am so pleased to start this series. Glenbard is a high school, as you know, and we feel it is so important, of such an important nature to bring programming to early parents that we have three events organized for you. So here we go. Janine Halloran is a licensed mental health counselor who has been working with children, teens, and their families for 20 years. She's been helping children and teens build their coping skills throughout her career in a variety of settings, including schools, mental health clinics, and in her private practice. She's the author of several books, including the best-selling Coping Skills for Kids Workbook and Social Skills for Kids, with, filled with games and activities for building better relationships, problem solving, and improving communication. Her work has been featured in multiple media sources. She lives in Massachusetts, <clears throat> pardon me, with her husband and two children. And it is a great pleasure to introduce Janine Hillard. Take it away. Hi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Gilda. I am so excited to be speaking in the Chicagoland area. I know you had mentioned that there's a lot of people who might not be in that area, but 
you know, I am familiar with Glen Ellen and I'm so excited to actually be talking in this area. My best friend lives there. And um, one of the last places that I went, it was in fact the last place I went before COVID shut everything down last March. Yeah. So I was in Chicago. I was in O'Hare on March 3rd. And thank wow. goodness I was able to get out. I got home. And then everything stopped in our, in Massachusetts on the 13th. That's really when things really shut down. So amazing, amazing. Well, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to just share my screen. And like Gilda said, I have, um, I'll take some questions at the end, but I just wanted to make sure that we got a chance to see all of the slides and get through some chat, some talks about um, some strategies that we can use to really build social skills and, and ways to help our kids deal with anxiety, especially, especially our younger ones. I like to work with children and teens, but I really enjoy working with younger students. And the reason is because we can do so much when they're younger to help when they are getting older. So you can build on the skills that they have when they're young and continue to build those when they get a little bit older and maybe not as <laughs> necessarily approachable or you have to approach them in a different way when they're teenagers. But I really, really enjoy working with the littles as I call them. So. Before we begin, I just like to start every single presentation with a deep breath. So if you just put one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly, close your eyes if you feel comfortable. And let's just take a few deep breaths and gather together. Open your eyes when you feel ready. I love to start the presentation that way because I feel like it really brings us all together and we're focused then. Now we can begin, now we can start talking. And so we, in our time today, I wanna talk about a few different things. First, I wanna talk about processing COVID with our families and with our children because it's been a lot. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say obviously that we are through a pandemic, obviously we are not, but we're going into sort of a different phase right now. Um, and so I like to have conversations with my clients and with my own children about what we've experienced so far and what we're going to do as we continue to move forward and walk forward through this together. I also want to just mention some positive and protective childhood experiences. I know that a lot of people are very worried and very scared and concerned about what, how this is going to affect our children. But I want to share with you some really powerful, positive, protective childhood experiences that are actually easier than you think that you're all doing right now. Um, so to help you realize that there are things that we are doing right now as family members, as adults who care, that are going to protect our kids as they move forward. And then I want to talk a little bit about social skills and then a little bit about anxiety, because those are the things that are the biggest concerns right now. How are the kids interacting with one another and how are they dealing with all of the anxiety that comes with living in a pandemic? So Gilda did a lovely job introducing me. Um, I am a licensed mental health counselor from Massachusetts um, and I have a lot of experience in school settings. So I started in like mo least restrictive, most restrictive, excuse me, and I moved to least restrictive over time. So I worked with kids who were placed out of their houses and out of their schools. Um, and then I eventually ended up working in a more typical school setting um, and working with middle school, elementary school, and high school all throughout my career. And I've done mental health uh, clinics, I've worked in social skills clinics, and I still actually do have a private practice as of um, right now. So I still see um, a few clients um, regularly. And so that's kind of, it's fun. I enjoy it. I actually saw clients all through the pandemic. So uh, it was really interesting to sort of shift how you work, especially with younger ones. How do you work online? How do you do Zoom with like a little guy? <laughs> so it was real. it was a challenge. And so it was interesting to see how that went and to figure out what the things were that I 
needed to do in order to make it happen and make it interesting and make it something that was valuable and didn't feel overwhelming to them. So I've been there. I've been there and I've worked through it. Now, right now I can see all of them in person. Um, and that's really um, exciting too. One of them was like, I can't believe it feels like we did that for so long and I don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> um, I also run um, two businesses. So I run Encourage Play where I really focus on the power of play and the importance that play um, can be the, the really big powerful part of a child's life that play is and how it really impacts social development and cognitive development and all sorts of things. So we'll get into that in a little bit. And then I also run Coping Skills for Kids and that's really focused on helping kids manage stress, anxiety, and anger in safe and healthy ways. That is what I want them to do. So that's me professionally, but I just also wanted to share a picture of my family as well so that you know, I am a mom. I am working through the pandemic over here. I'm a working mom, working at home, trying to also like have kids that were in school. My kids were remote all last year, the entire year, and they weren't remote and no Zoom classes for the end of 2020. So it's been a long, long time since they've been actually in a school building. Um, and funny enough, they actually start tomorrow. So in between these um, videos today, these conversations with you today, I'm actually helping and doing, um, do, getting all the school supplies ready, getting all of that sort of stuff ready, making sure that lunches are like on their way. So I am not only coming to this from a professional standpoint, I'm also coming to this as a mom, as a person who has lived through the pandemic, trying to manage and help our kids and work through it all. So I am there with you. We are in the trenches together, doing this together. So I want you to know that I, I understand. I understand that you maybe just wanted a few minutes by yourself for just, gosh, one moment. <laughs> So let's talk about processing COVID. A lot of things have happened. So when I first started seeing my clients again, and it was, you know, the end of the school year, summertime, and then we're starting this new school year again, I asked them these four questions. I would ask them, what do you want to leave behind? What are you done with, with COVID? Because kids will tell you, they love to let you know what they're annoyed with, what they're irritated with, what they're so over. They want to tell you. So I, ha I asked my clients, what are you done with? And I, you know, I don't want to ever wear masks again. Sorry, buddy. I don't want to not see my grandma again. I am so over Zoom. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do remote school anymore, that kind of thing. So just understanding the things that were really frustrating for them, the things that they did not enjoy about living life that way. But I asked another question. What do you want to take with you? So yes, we can start talking about the things that were annoying, but also let's think about the things that you enjoyed, the things that actually were surprising to you. So I had kids tell me, you know, I really like playing games with my family. I really like spending time with my pets. I really realized that I, I kind of like to, it gives me energy to be by myself. They realized they were more of an introvert than they had ever imagined. I think they thought that they were more of an extrovert than they, they were. And so they realized, oh gosh, I really, I like, I get energy from being by myself. It makes me feel more energized. Good things that you have noticed over time, living through a lockdown and living through life that the way that we had to live it before. Did you learn anything about yourself? That was really interesting. Um, I had kids say, you know, I learned that I know how to make new friends. I can make new friends. I learned that I'm really good at building things. I learned how to ride my bike. Th those are really cool things that kids were able to share with me. And have you been inspired to do anything? So I have had kids tell me, I've been inspired. I want to run a shop and I want to have these sorts of things in the shop. I want to learn more about my family. I want to do some family history stuff so I understand what, what my great grandfather did and where they lived and that sort of thing. So it's been, it was interesting to have the conversations with kids and talk about, you know, let's try and figure out, you know, yes, there were some things that did not go well, but let's find those gold nuggets in there. Let's find those things that actually were really 
good and the, the, the silver linings, I call them. What are the silver linings that you can find? And one of the things that I was showing and sharing with them, and, and you know, I asked them like, what were, the, what were the like negative things? What were all the words that you heard all the time over and over again in the pandemic? And we heard so much about vaccines and learning loss and the virus, and it was really hard. But then I asked, well, what are the things that brought you joy? What were the things that made you happy? And, you know, playing with pets, being grateful, time with family. And so those things are really something that I want to make sure that we continue to focus on. Are there things that we can bring with us as we move into this next phase? If we really enjoyed as a family playing games, how can we bring that into the next phase of this pandemic? As things, in at least Massachusetts, things are sort of opening up. Um, and so what does that mean? What does that look like? And you don't have to jump right into all your activities that you were doing beforehand. Maybe you take it a little bit slower because you enjoyed your slower pace of life. Maybe you discovered you loved gardening, those sorts of things. How can you continue to do those things after the, um, after this phase and into the next phase of the pandemic? The other thing I wanted to mention is this amazing study that was done out of Johns Hopkins. So it talks about um, positive childhood experiences. So we've heard a lot about trauma. Um, I've done a lot of reading around trauma and what they call adverse childhood experiences, those things that are traumatic for our children that they experience throughout their lives that could lead to more mental health concerns, lead to more challenges as they are older. But the thing that I like about this study is that it focused on the positives. So I'm always, I've been accused of being a Pollyanna a lot and I'm fine with that because I always try and look for the positives. I want to understand those adverse childhood experiences. I, I wanna understand what's going on with that, but I also wanna understand what are those things that are protective? What are those things that are positive experiences that we can provide for our children that are protective and helpful? So number one, Talking about your feelings with your family, that is a protective factor. So if you're talking about feeling frustrated, feeling angry, feeling worried, feeling anxious, that is a protective, positive childhood experience for your kids. The feeling that your family is supportive of you in challenging times, that is a protective, positive experience for your children to make them feel like you understand, you hear them, you support them participating in community traditions. And it doesn't say live community traditions. Even if you've had to do things a little bit differently because of the pandemic, where you can still celebrate a graduation, where you can still celebrate moving up to the next grade, you still celebrate birthdays, you still celebrate holidays. Those traditional important moments that are, we have those rich rituals and those are so key so making sure that you have those rituals in your family and in your community that is protective how amazing is that um, and feeling safe and protected by an adult at home and one that I did not highlight but I just like to highlight for those of you who are in the helping arena those of us who are counselors educators teachers occupational therapists people who work with kids regularly Having at least two non-parent adults who genuinely care, that is protective. Teachers are protective. Educators are protective. How positive and amazing is that to know that if there is a, a school nurse who cares genuinely about your child, that's protecting them. That is a positive experience that they are having. How amazing is that? All right. So, while we're gonna have certain kids who are more impacted by COVID, by school closures, every kid is going to experience periods of stress and worry and anxiety and anger, especially now. So as we transition back to school, um, kids will need some social skills refreshers, absolutely. And they'll need ways to manage anxiety. So I think about, Last year, like I said, my kids were fully remote. And the way our district worked is we had kids that were 
um, fully remote or we had kids that were hybrid. So they'd go in part of the time and be home part of the time. And we chose to keep our kids um, remote the entire year. Um, and so now in Massachusetts, there is no more, more remote learning. If you want to do remote learning, you have to homeschool, which we are choosing not to. Um, and so we are sending them back to school. So what that means is every single student in our district is going to go and be going back to a, a building tomorrow, every single one. Gosh, that's gonna be kind of a rough adjustment. There are gonna be kids who've never been in the building. There are gonna be kids who've never seen their teachers in person. They've only seen them on camera. There are going to be kids who have no idea where anything is. There are gonna be kids who are gonna be overwhelmed and worried. And there are going to be adults there who genuinely care, who are out there in the hallways, helping them get to their places. And that as a parent makes me feel amazing to know that there are going to be other adults who are out there who are guiding, leading, directing, supporting. If they have a hard time, there are guidance counselors that they can go to. There are school counselors they can go to. There's a school nurse they can see. That's amazing. And I think that's been something that has been, um, you know, really, I think it highlighted, the, the pandemic really highlighted how important those school personnel can be for our young ones, especially. They, you provide, the school and the um, educators provide so much support that we didn't even necessarily see and notice. And now we're getting it back. So I think that's amazing. So when I think about moving into this new school year, and especially because this is our last sleep before we begin school, I think about sort of three things that I want to keep in mind. I want to keep in mind grace, grace for our children, giving ourselves grace and grace for the educators, because this is challenging and living like this is exhausting. And yes, we are able to do different things than we were able to do. And yes, we know a little bit more and I, all of these things are true, but there's still such a learning curve and it's really uncertain. So we want to be given giving ourselves grace, giving our children grace, and giving the educators grace. And we also want to take it slowly. I've seen a lot of people struggle. Actually, even the parents of my clients have said, it's like, it's really hard to go back to work. It's scary. I don't necessarily want to take the train. So now I'm going to drive into the city. Um, I'm nervous about getting into with around other people. I'm nervous at parties and I wasn't before. So Give yourself grace and take it slowly. Please be patient with yourself and recognize it's awkward. I've been to family parties and I was like, this is really awkward. I've known you all for like 25 years and this is very awkward to be here because we haven't done it in so long. Um, but so just be patient with yourself and take it slowly and allow yourself that time to settle in. And then also gratitude. That was something that I was really highlighted for me um, at the beginning of the pandemic, especially when we were really in a full lockdown. Um, and I've, I had actually some of my teenage clients say, gosh, this gratitude thing is really actually helping me out a lot. Um, and being able to find the good in those small moments, like the sun is shining or the snow looks beautiful or that flower smells amazing, or I really love making this with you or those sorts of things, finding those tiny moments of gratitude, finding the good there. Every day may not be good, but you can find good in every day. So let's talk about social skills activities for young kids. So first I want to just tell you a little bit more about play. So I absolutely love play. I love talking about it. I love playing. One of the reasons I became a therapist uh, with kids is because I get to play games. Sometimes I will describe my job as I get to play games with kids all day long and it's really fun. So I play all my board games that I love. I get to try new games. Um, I get to see how they play and they teach me new rules and I love that. Um, and so play is fun. Yes, absolutely. But but play is amazingly important for development as well, especially around social emotional lives and around cognitive development. So I think about play and social and emotional development. So when I, I think about all the things that kids learn through play, and it's, it was actually really incredible to 
run social skills groups, to run social groups and see through playing board games, working on taking turns, working on following the rules, having good sportsmanship. What does it mean to be somebody who loses well or wins well? How do you show that? How do you practice that? When kids are playing, maybe they're playing um, car mechanic. I had this one group that played car mechanic. They were um, on the younger side and work, working through collaboration and cooperation and being able to self-regulate. Like not everybody can wash the cars. Somebody has to be on the cash register. And so how do you work through that? It's, it was really fun to watch them and to be able to help scaffold for them. Like if they were struggling to be able to be an adult and step in and say, oh gosh, I wonder how we can solve this problem. And we would talk through, okay, let's see, how can you do this? How can you do that? Let's figure out what's, what is, how are we going to what are even the roles that we want to play? I understand and being able to hear their feelings. I really want to play, be able to clean the car. I really want to put the car up on the jack, that kind of thing. So lots of natural ways that kids can work on social and emotional development through play. So I, that's why I love using play as a way to work on social skills because of the natural social emotional development that happens with play. And then there's also play and cognitive development. So learning and memory seem to be fixed more strongly and it lasts longer when you learn something in play. And play helps kids adjust to a school setting and enhance their learning readiness and their learning behaviors. And it's a great context for teaching cognitive development, for having cognitive development. Using play is powerful. And there's a couple of great books out there all about the importance of play. So one um, is called Play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination, and Invigorates the Stole. And that's by Stuart Brown and Christopher Vaughn. And he talks about a play deficit being similar to a sleep deficit. So we're, no, you know how it is when you have a newborn and you haven't slept, actually more like a three month old and you haven't slept and you're really tired. <laughs> and you feel like you can't function, that's what it's like if our kids aren't playing. And then Peter Gray out of Boston College has also done some work around um, research in play and correlating the decline in play to a rise in mental health concerns. So that's why I always try and talk about, let's make sure that they have time to play. And bonus, love this part, Play is a natural stress reliever for kids for just having them sit down and play however they or run around and play however they want to play is a stress reliever. So come having them have an opportunity when they come home to just play. When they get home from the school from the school day, just have a snack and decompress and play. I think it's amazing. It's powerful. So when I think about you know, kids are struggling as they're coming back and needing to work on being in interaction with people. So one thing I often recommend for kids who do struggle is having short structured play dates. Usually I, as, if a kid is really struggling, I say one-on-one. -on -one. So it's because there's so many more dynamics that happen, the more kids that you add into it. So if you can make it so that you have your child and then another child come together and play, for a short structured play date, that is the great, it's a great way for them to practice. It could be at your house, it could be at somebody else's house, it could be at the park, but I would really keep it time limited, one to two hours for the littles. Um, and then the thing about um, having a short structured play date, especially if your child is struggling, is to make sure that you are able to monitor and step in with when needed to help them learn that it's okay if they get, if they have an emotion, it's okay if they get mad, it's okay if they get frustrated, it's okay if they get sad, but how can they stop, take a break, take a deep breath, take a drink of cold water, switch activities, go outside to be able to shift it and then be able to keep going with the play and recognize like a feeling is a feeling and it just, well, it'll come and it'll go. It doesn't mean it's going to last forever. And that's, and all feelings are okay. I always say to kids, it's okay to feel anything. It's okay to be mad. It's what you do with those feelings that matter. You can say I'm mad. And that is actually really helpful for learning self-regulation. We'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So the other thing I really like to talk about is playtime. So for younger kids, you know, when we have playtime with them, so if we, we as the adults get an opportunity to play with them, it's so fun to do. Um, and it, it can be fun to do. Now I've been where I have had a child of my own who has like been kind of like focused on the Candyland thing. And I was like, I cannot play Candyland again. I just can't do it. And that's okay. So what did I do? I, we decided to play different games. I introduced him to some of my favorite games. So I would say, okay, we can play Candyland first. And then we can play this game that I found that was one of mommy's favorites when we were, when I was younger. So to be able to know that you don't have to be stuck in playing Candyland for the rest of your life, recognize that there's so many great games out there um, that will help um, and that you can play. So one of the board games that I, um, board game companies that I love is called Peaceable Kingdom. So this is a, these games, the series of games is all about cooperation and collaboration. So in order to win the game, you have to work together. So they have games that are designed for like really little kids, like um, preschool. So they have like lemonade shake up where you're serving people lemonade or hoot owl hoot where you're trying to get the owls home to the nest. But then they also have things that are a little bit older. Um, there's one, it used to be called Mole Rats in Space, but now it's called some Space Adventure or something like that. Um, Cauldron Quest. There's really cool games that are all collaborative. So if you have a child who's really struggling with that competitive piece, if you bring in something that is more of a collaborative game, it actually might make it a little bit easier because then it's all of you working together to defeat the game as opposed to you're working against each other to beat each other. It's a, it's a shift that can be helpful for some kids, especially those kids that are, who are overly competitive and have a really hard time being able to manage that competitive piece in, them, in themselves. I also really like Zingo, Monopoly Junior, Clue Junior. Spot It's great because that, that Spot It's really tiny. You can like take that on the go. Um, and word games are something you could, you can just do that wherever you are, you know, playing, would you rather, or two truths and a lie or puzzles, or just having conversations at, uh, dinner time, you know, coming up with some different uh, questions that you want to ask, like if you could have any superhero power, what would it be and why? And then also like some kids really love to move. They really, really benefit from that movement. So going on a bike ride, going on a hike, that's another way that you can, that is a version of play. Play is not just have, sitting down and playing with Legos or playing board games. It can, there's so many different ways to play. So if your play is going on a hike in a new place, then do it. And if that's going to be something that is renewing for you and renewing for your child, absolutely go ahead and do it. And then the other thing I always just like to mention is being able to set up your home in a way that is um, conducive to play. So being, the time is huge. Having those blank spaces of time in a schedule, which I know were very hard to come by before COVID, but seem to be more easy to come by now. Um, but to have that, that space in your schedule where there isn't anything scheduled, but it is an opportunity for kids to go outside or to play with the things that they have inside. And the thing I love is having open-ended toys, toys that you can play with in more than one way. So I think about Duplos or Legos, blocks, pretend play materials, gosh, a pretend kitchen, even a cash register. There's so many things you can do with just a cash register and food. You can play restaurant. You, oh my goodness, there's so many coffee shops, so many fun things that you can play. Um, and, you know, if you have dolls or figures or stuffies, like all those things um, that you can use in different ways, it allows for their creativity to show through. So the less that it's, there's actually a great study that shows the less toy, the fewer toys kids have, the more creative they get with the toys that they are playing with. So even if you have a bunch of toys, what I used to do is I used to divide them up into like three or four groups and I would rotate our toys. So I would just put the rest in the basement and I'd bring like a certain setup 
and then they'd play with them and uh, do different things with them, get creative with them. And then after a while, they'd get kind of tired of it. And I could see that their playtime was shortening. So I'd switch it. And then it would, it's that toy rotation and the novelty of these toys that they haven't seen in a couple months was great. They were loving it. They'd play longer. They'd find different new ways to play with things. And so it was really, it was neat to see. And we still, to this day, my kids are a teen and a tween, um, but they still love arts and craft supplies. I mean, gosh, they are still all over that. And they would love to do projects when we were little. That's what they called them. We do projects. Can we do a project, mommy? And I, when I go and see kids, when I see clients, I always bring arts and crafts supplies. I tend to be a person who loves scents. So I always use silly scents markers or silly scents um, colored pencils, which the kids totally dig. And then I think about playtime at school. So yes, they have an opportunity to do, to have recess. They have an opportunity um, to, have some downtime and talk with other people but sometimes like if there's indoor I know for us when it gets really cold we have indoor recess and indoor recess can be kind of tough it's like loud it's really that that is the one word that I would describe indoor recess as loud oh, it's two words loud and chaotic um but to have some a little bit of something that kids can do um, when they do have indoor recess. So um, Go Noodle has a ton of resources actually for home and school. They have like indoor recess um, videos, but they also have like yoga flows. They have deep breathing activities. Go Noodle has a ton of fun things on there. Um, and then another resource that um, schools can use, a box kids. And actually home too. Both Box Kids and Go Noodle have a home version and a school version. Um, so Box Kids is all about getting kids to do movement before they sit down for the day. So I have a principal friend of mine who is box trained. And so she would actually lead her school through a series of activities and exercises to get their bodies sort of like more like to get that energy out and get settled before they moved into their school day. And she found it really did help in terms of them being able to settle down and get to work after they had had that time in the morning. So I thought that was great. And then for those small group activities, as a former school counselor, I love small group activities and I love um, having those conversation starters and board games and card games in school. So I, I play a lot of Connect Four. Gosh, I've played so many games of Connect Four in my life and Uno. So lots of things that you can do at school. And I just want to mention for those of you who are in the education space, um, for uh, those who are like K to two, if you are looking for a phenomenal book to help you with designating and including play as part of your curriculum, you can go through here, Common Core is included, so you can use that. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible book written by three teachers who give examples from their classroom, which is so fun and powerful. And you see all these pictures and they talk about different ways that they incorporate play into their work and work into their play. So great resource, just wanted to share that with you before we move on into anxiety solutions. All right, so this is the other thing. So now we've talked about that social skills challenge that we've had that we have with our kids and making sure that we're encouraging play but now we, we've got to focus on the anxiety so I mentioned this before one powerful thing that we can do is to help our kids name their emotions and when they're little they can start with sad mad happy that they can start with something as simple as that and it is powerful uh, Dr. Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson have done, and uh, they have a body of work that is incredible. And they talk about name it to tame it. And it is so powerful for kids to be able to name their emotions. When they name their emotions, then they are more easily able to tame it. They're more easily able to self-regulate. So helping kids be able to identify in themselves, um, what is this emotion? Sometimes that's too much for kids. So when you read books, when you're watching TV, when you're watching movies, you can just start to bring up, oh, I'm noticing that this person is feeling this way in this book. What do you, or how do you think this person is feeling? You know, something like Daniel Tiger talks about his emotions all the time, which I really appreciate. Uh, Peg plus cats, the PBS lineup, 
can be incredible for helping kids identify what those feelings are and being able to say, okay, I can do something about it. But being able to just say it out loud is so powerful. I've seen it in action where a kid just said, comes in and is like, I'm really angry. Okay. And then suddenly it just dissipates. And then we're able to start having a conversation about, okay, what made you angry? Okay, what can we do? And let's figure out how to get you back to class. So that's the school counselor and me talking. <laughs> so that is one of my favorite things. And that's why I start with that. I wanted to mention that right off the bat is just that powerful being able to start to name your emotions at the be as early as possible. It is super powerful for our kids. The other thing I like to talk about is deep breathing and people always get a little bit like, oh, it's kind of hokey. I understand. I totally understand. But deep breathing is really important because what it does is it helps your body get out of fight, flight, or freeze and get back down to rest and digest mode. So if your body is, if your kid is overwhelmed, if a kid is feeling really frustrated and like really, it's so, it's like, you can see it. You can see it start to happen. One thing that can actually sort of help their body is to take deep breaths. Now, I will tell you that kids don't always like to take deep breaths and they don't always like, um, they don't always know how to do it. So I'll, you'll say, take a deep breath and they'll breathe in, but won't breathe out or they'll start to hyperventilate, right? Like they'll breathe and you're like, what are you doing? That's not what I meant. And they're gonna like hyperventilate and pass out, which is the last thing you want them to do. So one thing, especially for younger ones that I like to have kids do is imagine like their belly is a balloon. So you breathe in and you make your balloon, your belly bigger, then you breathe out and you make the balloon shrink. So sometimes I even use my hands to like sort of demonstrate out and in or a Hoberman sphere. I don't have it here. I'll bring it in for the seven o'clock one. <laughs> um, but just to breathe out, breathe in and breathe out, breathe in and breathe out to help them learn how to do that and to breathe from their belly and not from their chest because breathing from their belly will help them be able to relax a little bit sooner. Now, this is not like immediate hard and fast. Like as soon as they start deep breathing, they're going to calm down because that's not how it works. But it is a step in the direction to getting them calmer and to find a way that works for them is huge. So I used to work with, um, a colleague of mine and he is at children's and he talked about, you know, there's this um, client of his who he, she was really struggling, having a really hard time. And she was saying, you know, he said, I want to teach you how to take some deep breaths. So he taught her a way to take deep breaths. And he, she, she was a, a teenager. And so she turned to him and she was like, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. Um, and so he was like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, and they moved on. On, but he um, ended up going to a meeting with her. He, it was a, a, a big school meeting and a lot of people were there and they were deciding some really big things about her, her life and her schooling. Um, and he saw her taking deep breaths at this meeting. And the next time they come in, he's like, so um, I thought I saw you taking some deep breaths. What was, what's going on? Did, what, did I just miss see that or what was going on? And she said, oh yeah, I totally did take deep breaths. I didn't do it the silly way that you taught me. I taught myself a different way. And, you know, he and I agreed. It doesn't matter how she was taking the deep breaths. What mattered was that she was taking them and she was using a strategy to help herself stay calm in a really tough situation. So there's a ton, a ton, a ton of different ways to teach kids how to take deep breaths. So if one doesn't work, don't give up, try something else. So I'm gonna show you a different way that some kids really respond to called deep breathing with your hand. Also, sometimes people call it mountain breathing. So you can put your hand out and you trace your hand with your other um, pointer finger, trace in and breathe in, trace the other side and breathe out, breathe in and breathe out, Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And I like this one, especially for younger kids, because especially when things are starting to get a, starting to escalate, like you you know when it's starting to sort of like rise, right? So if you can step in sooner and try and diffuse the situation, 
by taking some deep breaths, that might be helpful. So to be able to have a child put their hand out and you trace, or you push your hand out and a child traces. And so the two of you together take those five deep breaths and it can really lower the energy level, lower the excitement so that maybe we could figure out a different strategy to use that you, when, you know, recognizing that you're feeling frustrated and you're feeling mad or you're feeling anxious, and then let's try and figure out something to do, but starting with those deep breaths to get things a little bit calmer. So their brain is able to process and think through and come and use some different strategies. So I love using deep breathing with your hand. And for those kids, you know, when you get, when you get to sort of like eight, nine, 10, when they're starting to get into those upper elementary school grades, they don't necessarily want people to see that they're doing a coping strategy. But the thing about this one is what they can do is they can put their hand on their lap and they can trace with their other hand. And nobody knows that they're trying, that they're taking deep breaths using their hand. They're just you know, maybe fiddling around with their fingers, but it is a strategy that kids can use in school that doesn't feel like they are putting their hand up in the air and it makes everybody look at them like, what are you doing? That looks weird, but it's something that can be helpful for them. Another strategy I like to have kids use is imagining their favorite place. So thinking through all the senses of their favorite place, what do you smell? What do you hear? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you taste? Is it warm or cold? Is there a breeze? You know, and I often encourage my kids when they are going on vacation or if there is a favorite place that they love, like maybe it's grandma's house or maybe it's auntie's house. Um, if there's something about, uh, if they've been able to identify that favorite place, I really encourage them to take a snapshot, make a memory and stop and use some mindfulness actually and think, okay, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I feeling? What am I smelling at this moment? To be able to recall that as they are going off later. It's like taking a mini vacation um, wherever you are. And again, this is one of those invisible coping skills that don't need to be used, um, that nobody knows that you're using, but you can do it anyway. And what I like to do, especially for littles, is have them either draw a calm spot or their favorite place or create a book of those favorite places. So um, taking pictures and making sure that they can recall it, because sometimes it's a little hard to recall it when you're younger. Um, so having a visual reminder of it can be really helpful or a drawing of it that makes you think about that is really helpful and they can keep it in their desk or keep it in their locker or keep it in their binder, something that is a way that can remind them of those, of that favorite place of that calm place for themselves. The other thing I really love doing is having kids use their senses their senses are powerful. So, you know, breathing, calm scents like lavender or vanilla in a sand tray, also keeping in mind with keeping in mind allergies or holding a smooth stone and feeling it in your hand or being able to look around the room and name all the blue things or taking a cold drink of water or warm drink of tea or listening to audiobooks. Those are all strategies that I've seen help kids settle down. It's a great strategy to help them as they are transitioning from home, um, from school to home. You know, having, I used to actually go and see a little boy. He loved, loved, loved audiobooks. He really struggled with reading. He um, had a reading disability, but he loved being read to. So he just listened to his audiobooks. And so that's what he would do. He would come home, have a snack, listen to an audiobook, get ready. And then he would be able to move on with his day. So I encourage you to find those things that are helpful for your child. Um, also some other sorts of senses, uh, thinking about like using your body, like body position, using, using, using movement. So doing push-ups against the wall. That's all wall push-ups are. So you put your two hands on the wall and you push in and out, just like you would do a regular push up on the floor, except it's not so hard, but it gives a little bit of movement to a child and gives them a little bit of a break. And also using a rocking chair. That's also something that I like to encourage kids to do. Um, 
the other thing that I just want to mention is making sure that we are continuing to focus and find those good things. One good thing that happens and draw about it, write it down, talk about it. As a family, you can do this. As a family at dinner time, it can be a ritual. For a while, we were doing that in the midst of COVID. We would sit down every day and I'd say, well, what's one good thing that happened today? Um, and it was always interesting to see sometimes it it was something goofy or silly. Sometimes it was something having to do with the video game. Sometimes it was something um, like somebody did something kind for somebody else or somebody uh, was um, able to help somebody else out or they really appreciated um, their sibling doing something for them. So finding those good things that happen, find one good thing in every day. So I would encourage you to practice those coping skills with your kids. Try one at a time, you know, just pick one that you think would be kind of your kids might be into and you can try it. Just start it before school or after school, during transitions or as part of bedtime routine and just see how they react to it and do it with them. You can do it with them because it's actually really helpful for you as an adult to make sure that you are also taking care of yourself, which gets me into not forgetting about you. This has been incredibly challenging. I was just reading an article today about um, a therapist in the Boston area who was saying that families, especially mothers, are very overwhelmed. And she is teaching her clients to her parent clients who are moms to just say no. No, no is a full sentence. You can say no. <laughs> um, but to help people make sure that they are make keeping their battery charged. It is so easy to let your battery as a person um, deplete. And I know as for myself, if my phone is really low on battery, I get a little bit like, oh gosh, I wanna make sure that I take care of this. But it's so easy for us as parents to sort of put, that, put our own needs to the side and take care of our kids. But here's the thing, we need to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves and helping ourselves refilling our batter, refilling our cups, recharging our batteries, because this is hard. This is extremely challenging. This is unprecedented in our lifetime. And we need to make sure that we are doing things that are going to be helpful to us and re-energizing for us so we can continue to wake up and do the things that we need to do. So I always like to help adults think about what are your coping skills? And I want them, I want you to think through like, what are the things that I like to do as a child? I like, I was a huge roller skater. Like I had my quads. I was all like, I have, I have these, I have dreams of like a purple and white pair of skates. Um, I love, loved, loved roller skating. What are the things that make you happy? What makes you feel good? What makes you laugh? What brings you joy? What makes you feel satisfied? And what gives you a break? What are some things that are going to be helpful for you? Is it taking a cup of tea and having a few minutes to read by yourself for maybe even just like five or 10 minutes? Is it taking a walk? Is it going out and doing boxing? I have a mom friend. That's what she does. She loves to box. And she's like, it's the best therapy. <laughs> it's, it's how I can stay sane and everything is I go box. I think it's a crazy, I think it's amazing. I love to dance. So I love, I love dancing. I love Zumba. That's something that re-energizes me, that refills me when I know when it's been a long time since I've been, because I can feel it happening. I can feel in my body, like I need to dance. I need to get out. I need to do something. I love to garden. I'm not great at gardening, but I do love it. I love getting out there and getting my hands in the dirt and seeing when things grow and eating fresh vegetables and fruit that I've grown in my garden. I've, there's something very satisfying to me about that. Um, things that bring me joy are quilting and doing, looking at family history. Those are things that bring me joy. And I love watching British TV. It's just really fun for me. I don't know why. I just really dig it. And I would just want to encourage you to break out of the food and the alcohol habit. Now, this is not to say I love Nutella. 
I could, I have, I can make great donuts from scratch. I'm really good at it. Ask my kids. I also love a good glass of wine. I lived in wine country for a year. I can talk to you about Pinot for a really long time, but I also want to make sure that I'm expanding my ways of coping. I don't rely on food and alcohol only to as the way that I am coping. I want to make sure that I'm showing my kids, I'm demonstrating I can play video games and it can help me relax. I can watch TV. I can go on a walk. I can do some mindfulness. I can go roller skating. I can garden. And I have these strategies that I can use that will help refill me. And sometimes we can do them together. And sometimes I want to do them by myself. <laughs> and that is okay. So I want you to take a moment as we are wrapping up. And I want you to think about what is one way you will recharge yourself over the next week. And it doesn't even have to be anything huge. Like nobody has time to go to a spa. I get that, you know? Like there's no spa day happening anytime soon for me at least. Um, but, you know, what are the things that I can do? 15 minutes to read a magazine just for fun. Um, finding those moments, it doesn't have to be long. Maybe it's like a five minute car ride, something to give yourself some energy back so that you can continue to do the good things that you have to do in your life. So I always like to end with a central aim of any society should be that its children enjoy their lives and acquire the skills necessary to become happy functioning adults. For this, they need to develop emotional buoyancy, coping skills, resilience, and the ability to form constructive social relationships. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and attention today. And I have a few minutes where I can take some questions. Wonderful. Thank you. That was, I, you made me laugh and I learned so much. <laughs> Thank you. So here's there are two questions that, that are right off the top. Um, your, the suggestions about calming the child down are all excellent. Sometimes you have a child who's just, there's no calming them down. They're, they're just, they've lost it. And, and I don't, I want to, they just, and it goes on for a, a certain amount of time uh, and there's just no getting through to them with, with the, you know, maybe in a few minutes, but not. So what do I do at that moment when they've lost it? Yep, exactly. So that becomes more about you as the adult, more and less about them as the kid. So, you know, you think about like a crisis, it's sort of like a curve, right? So if they're like here, you're gonna, it takes, it's gonna take a little bit of time to get back down here. So you as the adult, what you need to do is keep yourself calm. And that is like self-talk, using your own deep breathing strategies you, and being able to tell yourself, this is a moment in time, this will pass. And when you're talking to the child to keep your tone neutral and keep your sentences short and repeat the, the same thing over and over again, like I'm here for you when you're ready done and then just you can say that every few minutes because I, I've been there I've like as an adult as a parent and as a professional it can take a while that like down trail can take a long time right like if they're like here you have to like live through the rest of it and it's hard it's hard especially as a parent to keep yourself together and if you are blessed enough to be co-parenting with somebody and you can tap out for a little bit please do so there's no shame in taking a break because sometimes it is like it, you just escalate. And so you want to make sure that you're setting the tone. You're the thermostat. You're setting the, you're setting the temperature. You're not fluctuating. You're not the thermometer fluctuating. You're setting the, you're setting the thermostat. So you set the tone. It is hard. I'm not, it sounds, it sounds so simple when I say it, right. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> because we're human and sometimes they do things that make you mad and they they it sets something off in your own for your own stuff right but to be able to try and work through and learn how to get yourself in a place that's calmer and then wait for them and then have the conversation later very good thank you thank you um uh another one um I love that you feel so strongly about the importance of play. What would you say to a parent or caregiver who might be super concerned about school readiness and worried that the kids are not learning when they're just playing? I would say playing is learning and play is the natural way that kids learn. 
it's the it's the way the animal <laughs> kingdom learns how do you think cats learn how to be together they play how did how do puppies learn they play with each other they learn when it's too much when it's too little it plays throughout the animal kingdom and it's also within humanity we play and that is the best way that we can learn i i would say honestly there's some great ted talks about the power of play and stuart brown has one and i think there's another um person who's done a lot of research on play i think his name is tim brown they both have these great ted talks 20 minutes just about the power of play so if that's really something that is you're struggling with that, I would start and look at some of, like you can, it doesn't, you don't have to read the book. If you don't want to read the book about play, start with a TED talk about play. <laughs> Great. Uh, this is lots of questions on this one. My child's a perfectionist. I've uh, tried everything. Uh, we've talked about mistakes. Uh, what suggestions that you might you have? So I would continue to you know, have those mantras of mistakes or ways that we learn. Um, I love uh, the work that is being done out of Big Life Journal. I was actually just speaking for them about frustration tolerance. Um, they do a lot of work around resilience and making mistakes and being able to learn from those mistakes. I love um, using books like Beautiful Oops. Um, so it has, it's, it looks like there are mistakes in the book, right? So it looks like maybe a book is torn, the page is torn, but then he turns it into something beautiful. So continuing to re-emphasize mistakes are part of life and to talk about your own mistakes, to make it part of the natural conversation. Oops, I made a mistake today. Gosh, that didn't go as I expected to really help them re recognize that it is normal and expected it's, it is a problem. It's a thing that does happen um, more and more regularly. I'm finding where kids are like, I've got, it's got to be perfect, especially as they are transitioning from like elementary school where things were a little bit easier going into middle school where they're like, I can't, you can't get a hundred percent on everything. Like you just can't and be okay with that. <laughs> I was just having this conversation yesterday with one of my clients. And two last questions. One is about from a mom who has a child who's an interrupter and it's really, it's just too much. Yeah, so here's what I would say. I would say when everything is calm, have a conversation about like what, what is, what's behind the interruption? Are you worried that you're not gonna remember what it is? Are you, um, do you think that we're not gonna wait and pause for you to have, the, have that to enter in? And, um, being able to show them using videos, if you can, like, oh my gosh, I'm sure there's a good interrupter video, probably like Seinfeld probably has some great clips <laughs> where you can show like how you can enter a conversation more naturally versus like the inter interrupting a conversation to sort of like, just talk through the actual social skill of that and trying to figure out like, how do you enter a conversation without interrupting like that natural, like you, you have two people and there's a third person who comes up, how do you enter the conversation? You, you, you have to wait for a pause. You have to wait for a pause and you have to, it's trick. It's a, it's an actually really tricky. Cause you have to like, if you want to make sure that you're still on topic, <laughs> right. It's very, but do, having those opportunities to practice, like having those conversations where you are when you are at dinner and when you're practicing, having a conversation to be like, Oh, wait, hold on. And this, and this is, it makes sense. Now you can say this and helping them do that. Um, this is our last question. And um, I think uh, a good segue from what you were just discussing. It's about making friends. Uh, lots of parents concerned. Um, they've had the conversation with their child. It's just, we know that some child, it just comes more naturally to some. This one, this, this child, not so much. We've tried everything and it, it's not being received. So I wonder what, I, I, cause, because sometimes what happens is, especially at the elementary school ages, you tap out of friends at school, right? Like you've tried and it hasn't worked for whatever reason. So at that point I'd say, okay, expand your circle and see if there's other places that you can go. So find a group where of something that your child already likes. So if they're super into Minecraft, find a group 
that does Minecraft, maybe at the library or find a group that does Legos or find a group that talks about books that they like or movies that they like. So automatically they have something in common and that makes it easier to try and start having those conversations and building that friendship. But sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes you just got to expand. We saw that a lot in our social group where kids had sort of tapped out of all the kids at school, but then they found their people by, and they really lived in neighboring towns maybe, or maybe they went to a different school in the town and they'd never seen each other, but being able to find that common ground and hopefully something will bloom there. And maybe having a conversation that it's okay if you don't have lots of friends. Oh and yeah. One friend and yeah. And- all you need is one or two good friends, like honestly, one or two. And that is it. Like, I, I think I would rather see a child who has a really good friendship, a good deep friendship, rather than lots of several, several like surfacey friendships, right? Somebody, you know, you can trust and who gets your sense of humor and is respectful and a confidant, but then you, but that's a real friendship as opposed to these like sort of surfacey ones. I'd rather have one, one or two deep ones. <laughs> Again, lots to think about. Really good stuff. Taking care of ourselves, putting our own gas mask on first. Uh, copious notes here have I. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please, everyone, let others know that we are here. We'll be back at 7 o'clock, so spread the word um, and uh, get your questions ready, and um, we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye, everyone.